of uh, a bit of impressionistic style and a little bit of realistic style. I've never done an impressionistic style painting for the Fremont Art Association. This will probably be the first and I hope you will enjoy that. Um, at the same time, um, I, I will show you, uh, you know, um, some of my works. Um, I also will show you, I do have an overhead camera here. So I'm gonna show you how uh, the pictures that I take inspire me. And this can be from, you know, right out of my garden or when I travel. Um, I do landscapes and I do flowers mostly, sometimes birds. Um, I love painting windmills. Um, and, um, you know, um, I, I am terrible at straight lines. So I get very jittery when I have to paint a building or a structure because I, I somehow don't like symmetry in my painting, but then you have to have some of that when you do a structure. So, <laughs> but then um, I think um, when I participate in plein air events uh, where, you know, you had to sit in front of something and paint, I consciously try to paint buildings because that is my way of practicing structures. Um, and 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 it it's been okay so far. <laughs> um, I do have my own company called Daintly Made. Um, it it's it's spelled D A I N T L Y M A D E. I intentionally um, you know chose to miss out on the additional I. Um, my website is www.daintlymade.com. Um, I also have an Instagram account and my handle is titled Daintly Made. So um, what I'm going to do for you now is I'm going to switch over the camera and I'm going to show you um, photographs versus my paintings. So I'm going to switch the camera right now. Uh, I'm going to show you a painting that I'm going to try to replicate today. This is an impressionistic style. And let me know if you can let me know if you can see this painting. Yes, no? Yes, you can see. Excellent, okay, great. This is an impressionistic painting of a rose. Um, so it's 90% it's, it's wet on wet technique that I'm gonna show you. Um, it's, it's very fast. Um, because I'm going to talk today while I'm doing the painting, it may take a little longer, but I typically do this kind of painting in less than seven minutes. Um, so uh, that's that's how fast the water <laughs> you know moves on the paper when you do a wet on wet technique. Uh, so this is something that I will try and do for you today. But what I'm going to show now is um, how my photographs inspire me to paint. So. Um, I'm just going to do a very quick flip through. So uh, this is a painting of um, pansy, uh, sorry, a photograph of pansies that I took uh, at Chicago's um, uh, Morton Arboretum. And this is the painting. So I'm going to just do a very, very, very quick flip through. I hope you can see it. Um, this is a, a photograph of a hydrangea that my daughter took. And then this is this is my watercolor painting. So basically it's just inspiration versus painting. And then these are dahlias from my garden and then the painting right here. Um, this is a scene from Chicago during the winter. Winters can be really brutal. I had, <laughs> I lived there for two and a half years. I had a great time, but the winters can be really nasty. <laughs> um, so this is a picture and then this, this is my painting. Uh, this was from a trip to Netherlands in 2019, um, a windmill. But you know what? You see, I, my I can find so many flaws. You know, artists can be their own best critique sometimes. <laughs> so my lines are really, really not straight, you know, so I think I can do a better job there. But anyway, um, that's the windmill. Uh, this is a place called Don Seixan's beautiful place. If you happen to go there, you must visit it. Uh, it's got some, um, you know, at least four working windmills. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, this was from um, Tahoe, Lake Tahoe. Uh, this is Pigeon Point Lighthouse, uh, one, one of my favorite places. Um, so this, this is a photograph. And then this is a painting. Um, this was again, just, you know, I was just walking on a trail one day and just saw these wildflowers and, you know, just painted them. Uh, this is 
Austrian Alps, again in 2019 from the same trip. Um, and this is our beloved Elviso Adobe in Pleasanton. This was a plein air painting. My God, I was so terrified. I didn't know how it'll turn out to be. Um, but anyway, um, this, this, you know, fortunately <laughs> won an award. This was my very first attempt of a plein air painting. Um, this is a photograph that I took um, on the way on, on my way to Zugspitze, which is like the uh, highest German Alps. Th this was a train uh, that we took from Munich and I took a picture from a moving train. And then this, this is the painting. You know, the photographs really don't do justice. You know, I, know, um, in, I think I, I really wish you get to see the actual paintings. <laughs> uh, this was Door County. Uh, I just changed, the, um, changed it into a portrait painting. Um, again, just violas from my garden, uh, this photograph and painting. This is from Zion National Park. And uh, this is just outside Vente Vineyards uh, in Livermore. This is the photograph. This was a plein air painting that I did last year. Um, yeah, so uh, this was one of my de demonstration paintings. So anyway, I just wanted to show you how I take pictures and then you know, though that is, so my, uh, my style is basically taking a photograph and then coming back to the studio and painting. That's what I do, sometimes plein air painting. So um, that's about my inspiration. Um, I'm gonna share with you some of the uh, uh, watercolor materials that I will be using today to demonstrate. Um, so I'm sure you've heard of, arches this is this is uh, th this is a seven into uh, 10 inches block um, it is a, a 140 pound cold press uh, it's really nice to you know carry this around uh, you don't need to tape it down you know on the edges you could just uh, do your do your painting you don't have to worry about buckling and so on and so forth and then once you finish the painting, you just run your nail, you know, between the sheets and then you can just separate them out. It's really, really easy and very handy. Uh, so this is what I will be using today. Um, and then I have, uh, this, is, this is my palette. Uh, I typically use Daniel Smith. And ever since I used Daniel Smith watercolor paints, I've pretty much been hooked on to, <laughs> to those. Um, and my palette, it's really a colorful palette. I love, I love a lot of color in my paintings. So, uh, but I will certainly tell you the colors that I use. Um, if you see, I, and you, you, you will see throughout the demo, I don't mix my paintings too much unless I'm looking for a particular color. I just, you know, wash my brush, and then just take the paint and I let the paper do the mixing for me. So I have a thalo blue, I have ultramarine blue. Um, this is yellow ochre, uh, cadmium red light, a lemon yellow, a sap green, which is a base for all my greens, but I mix different, all of these colors to green to get the various shades. Uh, this is quinacridone sienna and quinacridone gold. Quinacridone colors, are um, you know in 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 comparison to the other colors, they're really strong pigmented, and I really love these. Um, they they give a lot of depth to the paintings. Um, and uh, for example, a quinacridone sienna, I would love to use on canyons and rocks. They give a beautiful red reddish like a brick color. Um, and then uh, quinacridone gold is also a very, very beautiful color. If you mix that with sap green, you get these wonderful shades of uh, you know, leaves um, or trees. Um, and then um, this is, um, I think it is um, a, chrome, a chrome green um, and then crimson. Um, and then uh, this is uh, burnt umber, which is like a, a really dark brown. And uh, this is a very, very sunny yellow color called New Gamboge, which I love to use on, you know, sunflowers, especially sunflowers. Um, and then we have an orange 
And then this is, um, you know, this this is a student grade color. <laughs> uh, you must have heard of a student grade um, uh, paints called Reeves, and I really like the peach color there. So that's that's the peach color. Um, so that that is pretty pretty much my palette. Uh, sometimes I have another uh, rather messy uh, palette here, uh, but. Uh, one color that I use a lot from this palette is um, a very dark and a dense purple. Um, and uh, what's it called? I forget the I forget the name of that paint. Um, but it's 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 a really it's a really really dark color, uh, dark purple. And this is a Daniel Smith paint as well. I'm sure I'll remember the name in a few minutes. But that's that. And then. Um, I try not using black or white in my paintings. Um, masking fluid is something I try not using uh, much also, and I am not going to be using uh, any of those today. I'm just going to stick to these colors right here. Um, so, okay. So the name of this purple, <laughs> I knew I was going to get it, is called Carbazole Violet. Carbazole violet. It's a really, really dense, dark uh, violet. Okay, now let's get to the brushes. Um, very, very minimalistic. Um, I don't care so much of the brushes as much as I would care about the quality of the paint and the paper. So just, you know, you could use whatever you have at home. Uh, this is a three quarter inch uh, Winsor and Newton brush. Um, really nice when you want to, you know, cover a large area of the paper. Uh, and then um, there's, uh, I, I alternate sometimes between the Princeton brushes and Escoda. Recently, I started using these Escoda watercolor brushes and I really, really like them. Um, so this is a number six. Uh, and then I have an angled Escoda brush here as well. Sometimes I use this to lift a paint, the Escoda angled brush. And then for the details, I use a number zero or one or two, like a thin brush, that's it. So really, you know, very, very minimal. And I would just alternate between these brushes depending on the strokes and the technique that I do. Um, yeah, and then at the end for little details, I, I I would just alternate between a zero or a one brush. So those are the brushes. Okay, now I'm gonna to talk to you about the really, really expensive, unconventional tools, okay? I'm sorry if, you know, if you find these expensive, but this is what I use. Okay, let's start. An old toothbrush. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, an old toothbrush. Um, I try to keep these separate, even on April Fool's Day for my family. <laughs> I, try, I, I just try to keep these separate, but um, I typically use these brushes, um, you know, like an old toothbrush. I do this motion a lot for a technique called splattering, where I just, you know, I just want to splatter some amount of either water or paint. So that's that's when I use this brush. Okay, the next one, okay? Next expensive tool is just a back of anything, really a back of a brush, a back of a knife, or just, you know, a blunt knife, a butter knife. Uh, so a lot of times I do I do this for grass. So when the paper is wet, I just use, use like, you know, a slightly you know, pointy object. While, while the paper is wet, I just flick to get, you know, short grasses or, you know, just uh, maybe, maybe the center of a flower that has stamen. And then you just, just flick the brush like that and it would lift the paint right off, okay? Okay. And then a very interesting tool that I use is this. It's called uh, Mr. Clean's Magic Eraser, okay? Um, so typically, you know, we use these to clean bathtub and sinks and so on and so forth. I just stole one from my package 
uh, for my watercolor. This is excellent, especially when you want to um, say at the end of the painting, you feel, uh, you know, you missed on, you missed out on uh, the lighter values of a painting. I use this to lift. For example, in this painting right here, I used um, the magic eraser. After the painting was complete, this space was brown and brown as well. And I felt like I needed a few lighter leaves there. So I would just, just you know, dip an edge of the, um, this sponge into water, squeeze out the excess water. And I'm gonna show you this today. And I just lifted it, just lifted the paint. And that's it. The only thing you need to be careful about using something like this is that you don't want to uh, be so harsh on the paper that it lifts the cotton away. So you just got to do it a little gently, but it will definitely lift. So I did these two and then, and then I did this little leaf right here as well. So this is another unconventional, but a really useful tool, the Mr. Clean's Magic Eraser. Um, sometimes I use, uh, let's see, I'm gonna, I should have it somewhere. Okay, a very old, a very old nasty oil brush, oil painting brush. Uh, this also works really great for two things. One is uh, if you wanna just use um, something called a dry brush technique where you dip, there's absolutely no water on the brush and you just, just uh, you just dip the brush into uh, concentrated paint with no water and you want to add some texture, you know, um, either on the roof of a building, you want to give it a rugged look or you want to just suggest that, the, that it's not a smooth soil and there's something going on there. I, I, I would just drag it just like that. Um, that's one technique. And then the other is, again, if I want to lift something, I could do the same technique with a, you know, with a, uh, with an old oil painting brush as well. I would just wet the paint, uh, wet the brush, and just lift it off just like that. Okay. So these are my very, very <laughs> inexpensive tools. Actually, you know, you, you don't have to go out to buy them. Just use. I'm a big fan of reuse what you already have at home. Um, and, you know, and you could still create a masterpiece, right? So, um, so those are the tools that I use. Um, and then I just use a, and just an old rag, uh, you know, to wipe off water or paint. Uh, and then I have, I have my water, just a mug of water here. And um, I like to use, uh, uh, you know, just, just to keep your surface clean or to wipe off something excess. I like to use these paper towels. These are Viva, Viva paper towels, V-I-V-A. Uh, the cool thing about these paper towels is that they don't have a pattern or a design. So they wouldn't leave additional marks on your paper. They are, they're pretty, pretty plain. It's absolutely plain, um, which would, you know, you, the, you, you could just, you just tear a sheet just, just like that. And then you could just fold it. And then just use to wipe off excess, you know. So that is something that I keep handy. And that's about it, guys. So with really very, very minimal watercolor uh, uh, tools that I use for my painting. So let's get started now. I'm going to do an impressionistic painting of a rose for you, okay? So let me get... Uh, get myself a little organized here and uh, please feel free to ask me questions while I'm doing the demonstration I would love to share you know and talk as I paint so stop me anytime if you have any questions or Tatiana if there are people wanting to type in something in the chat please please feel free to read them out for me um, okay um let's see I, I typically don't, um, 
draw. <laughs> I, I know <laughs> this is pretty strange. Uh, I don't usually draw, or even if I draw, it will just be an outline of the main structure. So I'm going to use, um, what is this? This is a 6B. You could really use any any pencil of your choice. Let's see what I have. Uh, okay, this is a, uh, this just a regular, just a regular drawing pencil. And I'm going to draw just the outline so I know where to stay. So, so, so the composition gives me a little um, control. This is where my rose is going to be. And guys, that's, that's pretty much what I'm drawing. That's it. It's, it's, it's really nothing more than that. So that's, this is the center of the rose and that, that's my rose. That's, so that's the drawing class, okay? Just a little outline of the rose, that's it. Now this technique is going to be pretty fast. 90% uh, of it is going to be wet on wet technique. Before I proceed, could you give me a thumbs up or let me know that you're able to see this paper very, very clearly on the screen, anybody? Perfect, thank you, okay. All right, everyone. Um, I very often carry this handy dandy spray bottle, okay? Uh, and all I do to, you know, to get my paints moist is just, just, just spray it on the paints. That's it. The easiest way to moisten the palette. That's it. Okay. And we're done. Okay. Initially, I'm going to be using the uh, three quarter inch flat brush. Okay. I have my palette right here. And my rag. Um, let's start. And you will see how fast this whole thing moves. So, first, what I'm doing is just adding water to most of the paper. Okay. I don't care if a, if a little bit of water gets on the rose, that's absolutely fine. It is a wet on wet technique, and we're going to be lifting a lot of paint as well. So, This technique of wet on wet can also be is very often used for sky or just to you know give a base coat to your painting, um, just an under underpainting coat. A lot of people use this technique. Okay, all right, that's it. And then I'm going to take um, burnt umber. So I'm going to be alternating between a lot of these paints right here, okay? You don't have to be strict about it. It can be any color. The rose can be any color you want it to be. The background can be any color you want it to be, okay? So, um, you know, when I do watercolor classes, really, you know, I just let my students know, just don't, don't worry about getting it exactly the way I am doing. This is your style. It's your uniqueness. It's your colors. Just have fun with it. All right. So I'm just going to um, just move the brush in random uh, motion. Um, I very closely follow uh, a Brazilian artist. His name is uh, Fabrio Cembrinelli, and I had the honor of attending his workshop. So this is a style that I learned from him. So it has so these paintings of mine definitely have his influence. Um, and um, one thing to remember, watercolor always dries lighter. Um, so while it may seem intense, it, it is going to be a lot lighter. And I will go back and add additional layers of paint or glaze, as they call. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm not able to use many technical terms, but I'm going to try to explain it in the most, uh, in the easiest way possible, okay? And um, right, and let me make some reds. Really, it's it's it is going to turn into a rose, I promise you. But this is typically what an impressionist paint, uh, impressionistic style of painting is, where your your main focus is only going to be on the main subject. Others 
are just a suggestion of what's in the background. You don't have to be very, very exact with those. As you can see, it's really, really quick. Greens out here. And some blues. As you can see, I haven't mixed anything, anything. I just took this blue and just placed some here. That's it. I haven't mixed anything on my palette. Now, do you see this hard edge here? I don't want to see that hard edge there. I want to soften it. So what do I do? I just wipe my brush, just moisten the brush just a little bit, take a little water and don't start from here. Don't start the blending into the paper here. Start from the edge and just do this. That's it. And it will just vanish into the paper. That's the best way to blend in a hard edge into a paper. Okay. Let me show you one more time. Let's say we have a hard edge here. I don't want it like that. I'm just going to wash my brush. There's no paint. And I'm just going to blend this away with the paper. That's it. And it would just vanish. Okay. All right. See, there are certain things you can only do when the, when the paper is wet. All right, let's deepen those colors. More green. Okay. We'll come back to this mess later. Let's get the center of the rose, okay? So for the center, I am going to dip my brush, let me change it. So now I'm gonna change from um, the three quarter brush to my Escoda number number six, six, four, you know, you could use there. I'm dipping my brush into crimson and that's my crimson right there. I'm gonna use some uh, quinacridone sienna. We are going to assume that the source of light is from here, okay? That's, that's where my source of light is. And all I did was just really blended that um, quinacridone sienna along with the crimson right there, okay? I wash my brush and let's say I don't want that hard edge. What do I do? Same thing, no paint, very little water, and I just, That's it, as simple as that, okay? Um, at this point, you remember I spoke to you about the, um, the carbazole violet? I'm gonna use a little bit of that, this color right here. I'm just putting it on the edge here. Just a little bit. Paper is wet, so it will blend in with the others. That is somewhat of, you know, somewhat a center of my rose right there. All right. Let me go back to, so I'm gonna keep alternating between these br brushes, okay? I'm going back to uh, the burnt umber. Oops, sorry. Okay, I'm going to show you um, 
the lifting technique to define the rows some more, okay? There is no paint and no water on this brush. I took the rag and I just wiped it off. Look at what I'm gonna do now, okay? Maybe, um, let me move to the angled brush and then I'll get to the other one, okay? There's nothing on this brush, okay? I'm gonna just lift. Lift. Okay. Do you see that? I'm just lifting the paint. to create some petal shapes. One more here, just like that. Our source of light is from this side, which means the underside of this flower needs to be darker. So, you never want anything stark white. So, I'm just going to blend that. This is a hard edge right here. I don't want that. I just blend it. And while it is wet, you could just, you know, add a, add a paint to differentiate, but you still don't want a hard edge right there, okay? Now, Okay, at this point, to, to define the rows further, I have to have this portion really, really dark in order for this to really look like a white rose. So it's always the difference in values. So I'm gonna be alternating between burnt umber Sap green and maybe a little bit of blue as well. Okay. Let me show you another technique, and that's called uh, negative painting technique, which is painting around a subject to reveal it, okay? Let's say I want a lighter color leaf right here. So what I would do is I would just take the background color, which is say burnt umber or sienna, and I would just make a defined leaf shape right here. Okay, and just color the background alone, just the background, just blend the background with the um, with that of the paper. And there you have it. That's the negative painting technique where you paint around a subject to reveal it. 
and there's my leaf. So this is the opposite of the lifting up technique, which I will show you in a bit. Okay, let's say we want another one. Uh, say right here. So I am drawing the leaf shape, and then I paint around it to reveal it. This technique is called negative painting technique. And then we just blend in the rest with the paper. Okay, let's have a little more variety of colors. Okay, like I said, we are defining the rows. So I I want the rose to be lighter than what is here. So again, I lift just like that. This is a hard edge right here. I don't want that. So I'm just blending with that of the paper. The, the problem with the wet on wet technique is you don't know where your paint's going. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's pretty, um, it's so fluid that you will have to come back and make amends and make changes based on where the water and the paint goes. That's, I think that's, that's something that I find very interesting, challenging, but very in interesting to work with. Okay. All right. The paper is really wet at this point in time. Um, I am turning to uh, the Escoda number six at this point in time. And I'm gonna define some of the dark, dark shades to reveal some of the petals. Blend it. That.
All right. This is not clear to me. So I am using the same technique just to highlight and differentiate the petal right here, a petal right here. Some defined leaf shapes. Uh, try not to use just one kind of green. So a lot of times I love to mix green with colors like quinacridone gold, reds, uh, browns. So to get the dark color, like, like the dark shades, and let me, let me show you. Okay, what do I use for lighter shades of green? I mix sap green with lemon yellow, sap green with quinacridone gold, um, sap green with yellow ochre and so on and so forth. And for the darker shades of green, I use, I mix sap green with uh, either ultramarine blue or phthalo blue and uh, sap green with um, quinacridone sienna, which gives a very, very in interesting reddish shade of green. And then I also mix um, sap green with burnt umber. So these are the shades that I typically use when I do green. Okay. So let's say, let's make some, you know, green, green, reddish green leaves right here. So just to add some interest. Lemon yellow. I I just took a little bit of lemon yellow right here, and then quinacridone gold. In the impressionistic style of painting, you really have the freedom. Your leaves don't need to necessarily look like leaves, <laughs> uh, but just to suggest that there is a leaf shape back there. Okay. So, all right. And let's get more values right here. Um, some darker, darker sheets of brown and blues. You know, sometimes the, the camera light may not do justice to the actual colors that I'm using. So I really wish at some point uh, you get to see these paintings in person. Okay. Okay, now, um, let me see. I'm just gonna change my camera view for a minute. And uh, I don't know if, can you, can you see this at, at all? Yes, yes, yes. Yes, okay. So uh, this is what it looks now, but there will be several coats and you know, glazes of painting that I need to, um, I'm just changing the view, that I'll need to do in order to further brighten. So at this point, let me go ahead, and I typically don't do this, but for this in interest of time, I'm gonna use my handy dandy, sorry, um, this is a hairbrush, uh, like a hairdryer, and I'm gonna go and mute, and I'm gonna dry this whole thing, and then we will do another glaze and finish it off with some details, okay? So I'm gonna go and mute uh, right now.
All right. The paper is somewhat, somewhat dry. Uh, now I will go ahead and put in more colors to make this section a little more deep and maybe just a little bit here as well. So here we go. Again, it's, I'm using burnt umber, um, quinacridone, sienna, and golds, and the same, the same colors. Some occasionally blues as well. Um, all right. And this is going to be a lot more darker because the paper is dry. All right, I'm going to lift just to show off some petals. Get this to disappear just like that. Okay, let me um, also show you how I use the magic eraser, okay? Let's say we want a couple of leaves right here, like the way I showed you. I just dipped it into water, squeezed the excess. Okay, let's see if this, let's see how this turns, but. A little one there, and then little one here. Okay. Just like that. Let's do one more here. Or let's do a little bud, just to su suggest that there's a little bud back there. Okay. 
So, okay. You can also wipe in between for it to show more, just like that. And if this were a butt, then you want a stem. So you can take a, a thin brush and let's say I'll dip it into a little bit of blue and green. You could also do burnt umber and just like that. And then let's have some twigs and branches. Okay, let me show you the technique with the back of the brush. This part of the painting is really wet. So I just take a back of the brush and just do this. And it gives a very, very interesting texture to the paper and the painting. Just like that, just with the back of a brush. You can do as little <laughs> or as much as you like. Okay. A similar technique of lifting is dry. I mean, maybe just slightly moist. I just took the excess water off. There's no paint. And I could just do, let's say there's a branch coming over the sleeve right here, okay? So over the sleeve, and I just drag that line like that. If you think you got too much paint, you could again use the uh, magic eraser and get the excess off just like that and use a paper towel and just, just wipe it, okay? So that is just to give some value. And we're done. So let me, let me show you from afar, maybe just a few branches here, I'm seeing a few branches. You could also add some interesting texture with the toothbrush, like I said. Um, I just dipped very little of it in water and let's say I take a uh, say sap green and the brown whatever it's like green brown blue everything mixed and then I just do this just like that doesn't do anything much to the painting just adds an additional you know interest 
So I accidentally got some green here. What, what do I do? I just, just take a clean brush and just get that off and just wipe it immediately with a paper towel. That's it, as simple as that. Okay. Um, let's accentuate the center a little bit more. So I'm gonna take the crimson. Then uh, quinacridone sienna. Then just blend that away. If you think this is not good enough, you want to make it more prominent, do the same technique, just lift and wipe, lift, and just dab with the paper towel, okay? Let's see, let me show you, uh, okay, so, I don't know if, can you guys see the painting? Yeah. Um, you know, sometimes it is about when to stop. I think that's always an artist dilemma, but uh, I might go later and maybe just darken a few of these, you know, a little bit of the background, maybe add some more branches once the paper is fully dry. Um, give a little bit of thorny, thorny structure to, to the stem. Just, just add, um, you know, dots and dashes. Let's see, just little. Okay, I'm gonna show you. <laughs> Sorry, let me show it flat. So, just add a few dots and dashes. Dots and dashes really add the final touches to. Um, a painting and uh, and yeah, so that's that's pretty much it with the impressionistic style of painting. It's pretty it's pretty quick. Uh, you know, you you could try this with any flower. You just need to be a little mindful of where the light source is from, um, what what segments need to be dark and light. And don't worry so much about what's happening in the background, you know, just, just focus on what's in here. And um, yeah, and that's the impressionistic style. Let me, let me ask if you have any questions or did you find this technique interesting? Any feedback, anything at all? Uh, uh, Tatiana, is there anything in the chat that? Uh... I, I have seen no questions. I just want to say it's so beautiful when you did this orange center. Center. It's okay. really make a kind of like point of interest. So cool. And it works so good with blue. I love it. Thank you. Yeah, Thank you. Is... I just yeah You're... admire that. You're very welcome. You're very welcome. Can you all see this, guys? Okay. Um, a painting mm -hmm. is never complete unless you matte it. Um, somehow it's much brighter on my paper here than what you're seeing on the screen. That it. Oh it, yeah, it, yeah. Yeah. So uh, if if you see this painting in real, it's 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 really really bright and rich. Mm -hmm. uh, I wish. What what I can do is I can send you a photo, Tatiana, later if you wanna. Yes, uh, please. Everybody. Yes. That'd be you know, if you think that'll help. Uh -huh. uh, I, can I, I want to ask you, uh, you maybe told in the beginning about paper. It should be very good quality paper to do all these manipulations. Yes, the quality of the paper is important because um, the arches paper is basically, uh, you know, mostly cotton. Mm -hmm. uh, so the, the, the level of absorption is very important when it comes to watercolors. 
Um, so, so for us to be able to, you know, because there, there are some, there are some papers that are, um, you know, in which the, the paint or the pigments and water don't sit into the fibers, if you know what I'm saying. So, mm -hmm. so, so some of these techniques turn out really great when you use the right quality of paper. And that's why I would recommend Arches or any other good quality paper. But if you want to practice, you can, of course, do it on a student quality paper. But um, I, I would just say that, you know, to get the most of the techniques that you're using, it's best to use something like an Arches. Arches comes in 300 pound and 140 pound as well. Um, I use the 140 pound. I'm very, very comfortable using, using, using that paper. So uh, the quality of paper, if uh, you know, if you want to expect a certain uh, level of result based on what technique you're using, I think that would be best achieved when you use a good quality paper, a watercolor paper. Brushes, I don't care much because it's mm -hmm. how you move your wrist, you know. Uh, but paper and then paint, 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 I think it's more of also about, uh, are you a person who likes subtle colors? Are you someone who likes bold and bright colors? Uh, do you like using a very watery wash or a milky wash, depending on the concentration of the paint and water? Um, you know, so I, I, I like Daniel Smith. There, 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 there are a lot of great uh, paints out there. I, this is what I use for, for my technique. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Any other questions, please? Okay, if there are none, what, what time is it now? Okay, so let me show you a little painting of a more realistic style this time. It's not going to be as fluid and flowy as um, uh, what, what I've done in this technique. As, as you saw, most of it was really the wet on wet technique. Uh, I'm going to now uh, switch the camera. And um, I'm going to use another watercolor paper, this time a small one. So I'm just going to set this painting aside. And uh, this is, I went to this art store uh, called Flax, and it had these 100% um, these cotton watercolor painting called Fluid 100. So I have used this recently and I'm just gonna to try to use this today to show you a smaller, this is a four by six paper. So um, I will just show you a little painting of uh, maybe pansies, or I could also show you this, which is, uh, I did this in uh, a demo last uh, last week with a, with a group, this is, um, I, I, I call these button roses. They're, you know, they look like little, little pink peonies. Um, so I could do either this or pansies. Any, any recommendation, Tatiana? Is there a particular flower you'd like to see? Uh, I'm not going to be using the three quarter inch, um, uh, brush very much only because this is a really small sized paper right here. Um, so let me show you maybe pansies. All right. So again, just a very rough sketch of pansies. That's it, that's, that's my two little pansies right here. So let me make um, some purple pansies for you, which means I will be using uh, the car Carbazole Violet uh, a lot. Now, if you don't have Carbazole Violet, you know, you can always uh, 
mix ultramarine blue and crimson that will give you a nice purple purplish violet color so you could just use that i always tell people don't go and buy out paints just use what you already have at home um okay so i will use wet on wet technique to begin with but very within a confined space so i'm going to completely apply water to these uh, petals right here, okay? We will first do these three petals, okay? And this is a wet on wet technique. It's just water and I'm taking my carposol violet and let's say, you, you see how that bleeds? That's the beauty of watercolor. And I'm just going to let that blend, blend in. Maybe a little bit of ultramarine blue. it. Let's move to this. This is going to be a dark, dark pigment. So I, I'm not using a wet on wet technique here. I'm using a wet on dry technique, wet paint on dry paper. And Now I'm just using water to just blend in. Taking a little bit of uh, crimson, not much, just just some. So as you can see, this is really controlled. Um, I'm I'm being, you know, a lot more careful, and it's not as fluid. So that's my flower number one. <laughs> Okay, let's do this flower right here. I want to give an impression that this flower is in front of the one behind. So the difference in value is very important. My these petals right here are going to be really, really dark.
a little bit of uh, blue. Okay, um, moving to my thin brush. I just wanted to differentiate between these two. So I lift and I do this process of lifting and painting and lifting and painting. Um, you know, it's, 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 it's just a process. Okay, let's differentiate this from this, okay. Right. So that's pansy number two. We will come back to it after it's somewhat uh, dry and let's work a little bit the background now. Okay. For the background, again, it's the same concept. I use similar greens. So let's just um, start with the leaves. There's another very nice green here. This is called, um, I think it's uh, gold, gold green or green gold. Yeah, that's also a Daniel Smith paint. It's a wonderful, wonderful color. Okay. Let's make a leaf right here. Leaf is never green, uh, never the same green throughout. So I'm just making it darker on this edge and then it goes lighter. Okay, let's do another green, say here. And I'm using quinacridone gold. And just, just have fun with those, uh, you know, the, the shades of green. Okay, that's another one right there. And just a few more. And, and then we'll call it done. But that's, that's how I do... Uh, so it, it does take a lot longer um, for a realistic style of painting because you're trying to you know, define every shape, almost every shape that's out there. I'm sorry, sometimes I know there's a dead silence and just <laughs> focusing on, on painting. Don't worry about these things happen, okay? All you do, what this means is when the painting has bled through, it just means that this petal is still wet. Just, just lift and wipe and it'll be okay. Yeah. 
Okay. You could also just do a little bit of a background. So what do you do for background? Just first, just add water. It doesn't have to be the whole background. It can just, just be a part of it. And then add, uh, add some greens, yellows, just have fun with it. Just like that. This is Taylor Blue. Continuing with the background, just slightly. We don't have, it doesn't have to be the whole paper. Just a little bit right there. Negative painting, uh, let's do right here. Let's say there's a leaf here, then I paint around it like that. And just blend it the rest of the, okay, but you don't want it stark white. So, you know, and that's good enough. Okay. Now, a very important aspect of um, you know talking about values and painting is, you know, you really get to differentiate between two subjects and the background and so on and so forth with with the lightest of the lights and the darkest of the darks. What I'm going to do is I'm going to accentuate just just to make these flowers prominent. I'm going to use some dark shades around them and between the leaves and let's see let's see what happens so um i will use thin brush and i'm going to use really dark pigments like a uh, green plus burnt umber um green plus blue and uh just differentiate some of the shapes. Okay. Just to make it more complete. Let me show you a stem in negative painting. Okay, I have this gap right here. So I'm just going to fill that. Let me show you, um, you know, just to make these stems a little prominent. Of course, you could take a dark color and just draw the stems out, but I use a lot of negative painting for the stem itself. So 
I will take a say a, any any dark pigment and draw out these lines. So there are two flowers. I'm going to draw two stems. So I actually draw the stem. Okay. And um, so let's do one here. I'm not going to leave it at that. I'm going to paint around the stem just subtly. just to reveal that, okay, th this is a classic negative painting technique that I use very often. And then there is the opposite of that, which is the positive technique, where you actually take a dark color and prominent, make, make the stems prominent, right? This is the positive technique. And what I did here is the negative painting te te technique. So I use a lot of this, um, when I do stems. So some are positive, some are negative. And then I, I also lift some. So, you know, really, it's, it's, it's just a mixture of techniques that I, <laughs> that I use. But uh, yeah, that is, that is pretty much painting like the realistic style of painting and then again once it dries I might go back and you know just adjust with dots and dashes um, and we'll complete the center I'm using uh, lemon yellow and a green mixture just to complete these. And carbazole violet again. To make these veins. Just a flick motion. Wow, let me you make it so easily. Oh, it's well, amazing! It's a, yeah, I, I think I just, uh, I think I'm just used to painting these flowers, uh, you know, very very often. But uh, uh, yeah, but that is pretty much. Uh, let me show you um, how it looks from afar. I would go back to it and do something more later, but uh, I'm just going to switch the camera. So it's it really looks very light, but in reality it is quite dark. And I might go and intensify the colors some more. But uh, this is how, and th this is a little four by six. Um, so there's the more impressionistic style of painting and then more of a realistic style of painting. Uh, but I, I really wish you can see this in person, but I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you, uh, Thank you very much. That was so amazing. And I love how you combine all those techniques. So yeah, cool. uh, yeah, I hope I hope you enjoyed it. I just want to let you all know that um, uh, and I know we're uh, close to time. Um, I So the Livermore Art Association 
is organizing uh, something called as an art space where ev every month an artist opens up their studio to the public for two hours. So it's my turn in September. And on September 24th, um, I will open up my studio for the public from one in the afternoon to three, it's one to three. And I will be performing a very short watercolor demonstrations in my backyard. Um, so I welcome all of you to please come, um, you know, we'll, I, I, will, I will take you through my little space um, and uh, we, we'll, we'll do a watercolor uh, painting outside. You could join me painting if you like, but I did want to invite. So September 24, one to three with a live demo. The live demo will start at 1.30 p.m. Uh, and it's going to be out in the lawns right here. So um, yeah, but um, if you have any questions, comments, and uh, uh, Tatiana, can we can we go on gallery mode so we see everybody? Oh yeah, yeah. I will stop recording for now.